I don't know about you, but every now and then I will have an encounter with someone I'm out in public where I know that I am supposed to know them, but I cannot remember who they are or where I know them from. This certainly happens to me. It happens to me at times where people come up to me that I have no idea who they are, but they know who I am. But then there are other times whenever um, I, I will see someone and I like the face. There's the face. Who I, I know this face, but I can't think of if I know them from church, if I know them from the gym, because how many of you gym people, you know you see the same people all the time. Uh, if I know them from like the ball fields, because both of my boys have grown up playing sports and between school activities and sports, there's so many people that we've come in contact with. So I'll see the face and I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, is this, is this a sports thing? Is this a, 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 a church person? Is this a gym person? And we just have this conversation and all right man we'll see you later you it was great great to see you and I don't know if I should say see you Sunday or or see you this week at the gym I don't, I don't really know what I'm supposed to say I walk away wondering who was that man you know who was that woman and 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 in this series we're going to talk about this idea a little bit because the disciples asked this very question of Jesus in in Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, in their amazement, the disciples asked, Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? Who is he? And, and, and from that time until now, for generations, people have asked the same question about Jesus. Who is this man? As a matter of fact, this, this is the man that has been studied and scrutinized. Jesus has. He's been adored. He's been criticized. More people have been devoted to him and yet have opposed him than anyone else in human history. So when we ask the question, who is this man? Like this is the most important question we could ever ask or ever consider. And, and ladies and gentlemen, this is a question that we need to work out. Like it may not matter if I'm able to actually place the person who I saw at HEB, but when it comes to finding out who Jesus really is, we need to work this one out. Like, and, and, and with good reason, because the life of Jesus impacts every single person on planet earth. Every single person that sits in this room, every single person in Bulverde and in Midtown and Stone Oak, every, every one of you watching online today, the life of Jesus impacts you. James Allen Francis said it this way about Jesus, he never wrote a book, he never held an office, owned a home, he never went to college, he never even traveled more than 200 miles from the place that he was born. While he was still a young man, the idea or the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he had on earth while he was dying, which was his coat. 19 wide centuries have come and gone, and yet today, Jesus remains the centerpiece of the human race. He said, I am far within the mark when I say that all of the armies that ever marched, all of the navies that ever were built, all of the parliaments that ever sat, and all of the kings that ever reigned, all put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life, the life of Jesus Christ. I am not sure, come on, what you believe about Jesus today, but I want you to know the truth is his life changed everything. His life, his death, and his subsequent resurrection changed everything. Everything. So in this series, we're going to look not at just who history says Jesus is, 
But we're actually going to look at who Jesus himself says he is. We're going to look at some statements that Jesus made about himself. The truth is, if you did a Google search on who Jesus is, I'm not telling you to do it right now because, you know, we're having church. But, but if you were to do that this afternoon, you would come up. The other day, I came up with nearly 2 billion responses of who. I just simply asked, who is Jesus? And I came up with nearly 2 billion results because people have come to all sorts of conclusions as to who he is. The truth is there are all manners of crazy ideas. There are people that have this, 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 this unhealthy fear of Jesus. Like he's like that, that highway patrolman. And that I'm, I'm not, I have nothing against you people. I thank God for all of you amazing first responders and all that stuff. So, but, but sometimes we're afraid of you. We're driving down the interstate. And some people think of God that way. Like he's the highway patrol sitting in the median of the highway. Just pointing that radar gun at you. Waiting on you to come over the hill. Going nine miles an hour over the speed limit. And he's going to turn those blue lights on and pull you over. And walk up. Ha <laughs> License and registration please. I've been there a time or two. I caught you, didn't I? Caught you, didn't I, son? Uh, And some of us think that this is how Jesus is. Some of us think that Jesus is out of touch. Like he's outdated. He's just like this old dude sitting on the porch of heaven in a rocking chair with a long beard and a blankie draped over his knees, just rocking back and forth. Kind of like you're not even sure if he's really with us or not. He's He's, his eyes are open sometimes, they're closed sometimes, and, and when we try to say, uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus, ah, ah, what are you talking? We think of, that he's just kind of out of touch, can't hear. Some of us think of Jesus as being too busy, too busy to help us. Like when you go to Home Depot, you know what I'm saying, and you're just looking for, I just, I just need a little box of, of screws. I'm not sure what to buy, though. Could someone help? I, could, could you help me? I just, and, and if you work at Home Depot, I love you. Just, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not anti-anybody today. I'm not anti-highway patrolman, not anti-old people, not anti-Home Depot people. Um, but sometimes I just want some help at Home Depot, and I just can't seem to find anybody to help me. Everybody's so busy. And sometimes that's how we think of Jesus. He's too busy with other bigger problems than just the little box of of, of, of nails that I'm looking to buy. He's got too many other things to do. The truth is, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is the message version, he said, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. And the truth is, if anyone could have preached polished sermons and, and talked the latest philosophy, it was the Apostle Paul. Because he was an incredibly educated man, and and, and he could have, but he said, I actually deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. Paul said, we first need to understand who he is. Before we can even really wrap our mind around what he did for us, we got to understand who he is. And as we preach this this sermon series leading up to Easter for five weeks between now and Easter, I want to talk about who Jesus is. Because in order for you to live out your faith the way that you need to live out your faith, that you want to live out your faith, the way that for for you to serve God the way that he wants you to serve him and that you need to serve him, the only way that we can tap into the power and the strength and all of the benefits that God has for us is for us to understand who he is. We need to work this out. We need to know who he is. Now, I know that there have been, you know, again, some two billion conclusions that people have come up with about who Jesus is. But just because there are that many different conclusions and clearly they're not all right, that does not mean that you and I can't search in God's word and find out who he is. It's interesting because I saw some uh, information this week which was 
I say interesting, it was actually a little bit disturbing. I read an article that was published, and I looked it up myself, um, in Newsweek uh, back in 2020. I don't know if y'all remember 2020, uh, but in August of 2020, um, there was some research published by Legionnaire Ministries, and 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 in their uh, in their survey, they had they had results returned that some 52 percent. 52% of Americans said that Jesus was a great moral teacher, but that he was not God. And and that was a bit astounding to me. This is not a new idea, of course. I've heard for years, um, this was a great man, not not God, but he he, he was a great man. But the truth is, I I want you to stop here. Because when you start to look at the things that Jesus said about himself, And this is what we're going to look at over the next five weeks. We're going to look at statements he made about himself. You're going to realize that either he's crazy, he's evil, or he's God. Because you you get into this dilemma because of the statements he makes about himself. C.S. Lewis said it this way, talking about Jesus being God. C.S. Lewis said, I'm trying to, to prevent here anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus, which is, I'm ready to accept that he was a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. And he said, this is one thing that we must not say. Because a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else the devil himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher, because he has not left that option open to us. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, he's either Lord or he's a liar. So we have to make our decisions. So we're going to talk about this as we lead up to Resurrection Sunday. And and we're going to look through the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at five statements Jesus made about himself. And the first one today is in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, there are a lot of amazing things that happened before Jesus entered in this conversation where he declared something about himself. Things that you probably know about or you've heard about. And even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not really familiar with the Bible, you've quite possibly heard about Jesus walking on water. Or you've heard about him uh, taking five loaves of bread and two fish that a child had and, and breaking it and multiplying it and feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. Uh, you've probably heard about those two crazy, amazing miracles. And those two miracles happened in the Gospel of John chapter 6 before where we're going to pick up reading. And by the time we pick up the reading, Jesus has left with his disciples and he has gone away from the people that he had fed the day before with the five loaves and two fish. And the people are looking for him. They're they're searching for Jesus. Where is this man that took this little bit of food and actually turned it into a lot of food? Where where is he? They kind of want to know where he is. And I just want to declare today that in 2023, I do believe that people are searching for Jesus. I do believe that there is a legitimate hunger for Jesus in our world. I think that it's surfacing in a way probably unlike we've ever seen it before in all of history. Like we're seeing, we're seeing kind of outbreaks of the presence of God falling and people craving and crying out for the hunger of God, for the presence of God because they've, they've realized that the things that they thought were going to satisfy, the things that they thought were going to fill them, they are not filling them. They are not satisfying them. And so they're searching for this supernatural experience with Jesus. They are, they are searching for more than information. They're also searching for transformation, like this transforming power of God. And so they're searching for him. Now, the truth is, as you'll see what Jesus says, in his own words, the people were looking for him for the wrong reasons. 
In John chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus replied when the people finally found him. And they said, oh, here you are. Here you are. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understand the miraculous signs. He's like, you're looking for me for the wrong reasons. But before we get all, oh, I cannot believe those people. Let's remember, we are those people. We are those people. Because we have all been guilty of, of pursuing Jesus for the wrong reasons. Pursuing him for his power more than his presence. Pursuing him more for what he can do for us than just getting into his presence for what he is capable of more than the truth that he is the Christ, the, the anointed one. We have all been guilty. And so, so th they start talking to Jesus and he's telling them who he really is. And, and they say, well, Lord, if, you know, if, if you're really Lord, then show us this miraculous sign. If you want us to believe in you, then, then do something. You know, perform some magic or something. After all, they said, our, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed in the wilderness. And they're, they're literally talking about back when Israel was delivered from Egypt and they were in the, in the wilderness for 40, 40 years uh, before they passed into the land of promise. And, and they, said, they said, Moses called down manna from heaven and, and, and fed them. So Moses can do that. Why don't you do something? And Jesus is a little bit irritated. And he says, guys, Moses did not give you the, that bread. My father gave you that bread. And now he's offering you the true bread from heaven. And they were like, okay, cool, cool. Verse 34 of John 6, they said, sir, then, then give us that bread. So again, whatever bread it is you're talking about, we want that bread too. That we'll, we'll have, we'd like that every day. And this is where Jesus replied and said, I am the bread of life. Everybody say, I am. Come on, say it, I am. I am the bread of life. And when Jesus made that statement, I am the bread of life, he said something very very significant. Some people claim that, that Jesus actually never claimed to be God. But the truth is, when he said, I am the bread of life, this statement defies that idea. Because when he said, I am the bread of life, this brought their minds back to the story of Moses, where Moses was in the wilderness and, and, and God speaks to him out of, a, out of a burning bush that was on fire that was not being consumed. And God said, you need to go get my people out of, out of Egypt. Get them out of captivity. And Moses is like, I, you want me to go talk to Pharaoh? You want me to waltz in there and say, hey, let, let my people go. Who, who am I? And he said, God, who am I going to say sent me? And God said, tell them that I am sent you. So when Jesus uses that same phrase... I am. When he uses that same language, he taps into that same spiritual authority that God used to Moses. And in their minds, the people of Israel, this, this would be no doubt. This would leave no doubt as to the fact that Jesus was claiming to be God. In fact, all throughout the Gospel of John, he made claims like this. you got to understand the only reason that Jesus was brought to trial and crucified is because he claimed to be God. He, this is the reason that he was crucified. So when he says, I am the bread of life, he's saying, I'm the one you've been looking for. So now that we know who he claims to be, let's look at what Jesus claims he can do. What can the bread of life do for you and I? Reading in John chapter 6, verse number 47, we're going to pull three things out. And then I want to share three things Three different ways that we can respond to, to Jesus being the bread of life. First of all, he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Eternal life just by believing. So the bread of life, if you take a note, you can write this down. The bread of life is the only thing that can save you and I. The bread of life is the only thing that can settle our eternity. If you want to have eternal life, 
You can only find that in Jesus. Jesus is saying you don't, you don't have to posture yourself just right. You don't have to try to earn enough points. You don't have to try to perform in certain ways. You just have to believe. As a matter of fact, belief is a theme of the Gospel of John. Um, in John chapter 20, verse 31, John, John writes, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Listen, you can, you, you can never hear this enough that Jesus stepped out of heaven and he stepped into history. He was there in the beginning. All things were created in him, by him, and through him. And yet, he chose to come to earth, God in flesh. And he lived this perfect, sinless life so that he could bridge the gap for you and me. Between an imperfect people and a perfect God, Jesus came to bridge that gap. And the only way that we can get to God is through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus by believing in him. Because Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that all have sinned. Everyone has sinned. You have sinned. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're a sinner. And you go, we're going to have fun in church today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the other one and say, you too, you too. Come on, isn't that fun? Doesn't that feel good? It does. It feels good. We'll talk about why that feels good here in a minute. Um, but for everyone has sinned. We all have sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Like none of us are good enough to get to God. Like it didn't matter how great. Well, my grandma was pretty. I'm sure she was an amazing woman of God. But even she needed Jesus to have salvation. She needed to believe in Jesus and the work that Jesus did on the cross so that she could be saved. The only way that we can have eternal salvation is through Jesus. The only way we can settle our eternity. So the, so the bread of life is the only thing that can save us. Now, that's not all it does. There's a couple of more things that I want to share with you that the bread of life does. And, and the next one... Um, will probably make you feel a little bit even better because um, it's more temporal right now. And, and, and the truth is, when we talk about God settling our eternity, we all struggle with that a little bit because we have such good lives here. So we have trouble wrapping our brain around heaven and, and eternity. But I, I do want to tell you that we need Jesus and we need to believe in Jesus because our eternity does need to be settled. We are going to spend it somewhere we are either going to spend it in heaven or we are going to spend it in hell. It is up to us to make the decision to believe. The scripture tells us in Hebrews that it is appointed unto man once to die. You're going to die. Everybody in the room is going to die one day. You're going to die. And the scripture says, and after that, the judgment. So you're going to die and then we're going to be judged. And it's not about accumulating enough points and having enough tickets to be, well, I think I have enough to be saved. No, no, it's about believing. And if you've committed your life to Jesus and you've believed in him, then your eternity is forever settled. So do you know where you will spend eternity? Have you made that decision? Have you taken that step? We need to settle our eternity. But for, but for now... Here on this earth, look at what the bread of life does. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The bread of life is the only thing that can satisfy you. He settles us, settles our eternity, and he can satisfy us today. We look for so many things for satisfaction in our world. Have you ever been just really, really satisfied after eating this amazing meal? There's nothing like that. Just, whoo, ha, that feels good. But, you know, in, in, our, in our spirit man, our spirit, our spirit woman, we seek so many things to satisfy us, right? We, we bounce from relationship to relationship, job to job, career to career, city to city, church to church. We bounce, we, 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 we look for, we try to get more followers on, on TikTok or Instagram. Like we're just trying everything that we can to get people to like our posts. People out here selling their souls, literally, 
to get people to, to like a post that they, have, that they have made. It's really unbelievable, only to discover that when they get the likes, when they get the followers, that still doesn't satisfy them. It does not feel them. It still leaves them feeling empty because, ladies and gentlemen, and if you're in the room today at any of our locations and there's kind of an emptiness in you and you've been looking for satisfaction, you've been looking for fulfillment, you have come to the right place. And I want to declare to you today that the deepest longings and desires of the human heart will never be satisfied with things in our world, with money, with relationships, with, with likes, with followers. The only way you can really find satisfaction for your todays is through a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. It is possible for you to have fulfillment. But it is possible for you to feel fulfilled. It is possible for you to have hope and joy and life. But the only way that's going to happen is through a relationship with Jesus. I believe in the bread of life. He saves me. I believe in the bread of life. He satisfies me. And then the next and last thing that the bread of life does is, is Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate Manna in the wilderness, they all died. But anyone who eats the bread from heaven will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If you eat this bread, you will live forever. The bread of life is the only thing that can sustain you. It saves me, it satisfies me, and it sustains me. It saves me for eternity, satisfies me today, and it sustains me for my tomorrows. This is why, and I won't, I won't spend much time on this, but we're always talking about, about spending time in God's presence every day, like tapping into the bread of life, the manna from heaven. Jesus said, I am that manna. Tapping into that every day so that you can be sustained throughout the day, so that when you get that unexpected call or that unexpected text or you get called into that meeting that you didn't know was going to happen or, or that event transpires and, and a lot of people are would freak out about that, but you're calm and you have peace because you've tapped into the bread of life and it is sustaining you. Now, let's look at our response to the bread of life. Let's look at how we could, maybe should not, and maybe should respond to this statement that Jesus made about himself. And we're going, to look at, we're, going to, we're going to look at this by looking at how the people in John chapter 6 responded. And this is the first thing that happened. In John chapter 6 verse 41, the Jews began to criticize Jesus for saying, I am the bread that came down from heaven. It's kind of amazing to me that anyone would criticize Jesus. I mean, nobody criticized Jesus, criticizes him anymore, Right? Nobody criticizes the Bible. Nobody criticizes the church in 2023. I can't believe somebody would do that then. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to understand, people have been criticizing Jesus since Jesus came to this earth, and they're still doing it today. He said in John 6, verse 42, they said, um, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? And we, we know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? And Jesus replied in verse 43, I love this. Stop complaining about what I said. If you'd stop complaining and you start believing, it's amazing what the bread of life could actually do for you. If you stop trying to figure it out, stop being frustrated, stop being so critical. So that's the first response is we can be critical. They were critical, and sometimes we can be critical as well. It's amazing how easy it is for us to be critical, isn't it? We, we so easily criticize the things that we don't understand, the things that frustrate us. We criticize people who are doing things that we wish we were doing, but we don't have the discipline or the passion to do it, to work hard like they have. We criticize things that we are threatened by. And people have been critical of Christianity from the very beginning, and y'all, they still critical today. People are critical of, the, of God's word because it is in direct contradiction. Like it is diametrically opposed in so many ways to modern culture. 
It's amazing how far culture has moved, even like, let's, like it's been accelerated in the last few years, y'all. How far culture has moved away from the true moral compass of the Word of God. And God's Word has not moved. God's Word has not moved, but culture has. And so it's amazing how when people look at God's Word, oh, that is so offensive. That is just offensive to me. And woe be it unto me if I do anything that offends you. Lord, I don't want to offend nobody. And the truth is, I don't want to offend people. My goal is never to offend. The church doesn't need to to take an offensive posture. Uh, In fact, if anything, I probably err on the side of grace more than I... Well, I don't know if you could say more than I should. But but I I shy away from offense. But you got to understand, y'all, the word of God in the gospel, by its very nature, is offensive. Because it draws a hard line. And nobody in 2023 wants hard lines. Yeah, I want to do what I feel like doing. That's fine. You can do what you feel like doing. That does not make you right. There is only one right, and it's this right. It's not culture. It's not how you feel. Lord, if you're going to follow your feelings, they're going to change from day to day. If I live by my feelings, I'd be in prison right now, y'all. We can't live by our feelings. We have a truth. I'm not going to base my truth on what culture says. Culture that's constantly contradicting itself and proving that it's confused. You're like, well, last week y'all said this and now y'all saying this. Right. Why don't we just go to God's word, which is forever settled. It has not changed. It has not changed. And yeah, it, it, it is a little bit... Offensive. It doesn't leave room for you to say, well, that's not the only way to be saved. Yeah, Jesus is the only way to be saved. And, and you might find that offensive. That's what the book says. But it's not just people that don't know Jesus that are critical of, uh, of him. Uh, the church can be guilty of being critical as well. We criticize the way God's moving in other places. We criticize things that we don't understand. Like, like, like he does things and we're like, I, I've never seen him do that. It must not be God. I, I, I don't really know how he could save those people, those people. So it, it can't be God because if I were God, well, you're not God. And the truth is, I don't understand how we could have the unmitigated goal to believe that we have been around for so long, that we know so much about God, that there's not any levels or dimensions of him that we, that we don't know. How in the world do we think that that we have a right to say who God's going to reach and how God's going to reach them? And yet, I'm not saying you people do this, but but Christian critics are all over the place, criticizing what God is doing in other places. The revival in Asbury, that must not, that can't be a real revival, because if it was real revival, blah, 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 as if you know how God is going to move. You don't have any corner on the move of God. He's the only one that has a corner on his move. We can be critical ourselves. We can be critical of people that God has called us to reach. Like we'll criticize sinners for acting like sinners. They are sinners. They are lost. Of course they are going to act like lost people. Don't criticize them. Reach them. Don't burn the bridge. Build a bridge. This is who God has called us. I'm not going going to water down truth. We're going to speak the truth, but we we don't want to burn a bridge between us and the people that God has called us to reach. But but Lord, have mercy. We're all guilty. I'll drive by the golf course on Sunday morning on the way to church and see people out there teeing off, and I'm like, enjoy your golf game while you go to hell. I mean, (laughs) shut I hope to shoot low today. I hope it's worth it. Because hell's going to be hot. But... but now I just say, although they probably went to Saturday night church. They probably went to Saturday night church. <laughs> we got to be careful of being critical. If, if you find yourself in a critical posture, ask yourself, why? Why am I criticizing what Jesus is doing and what Jesus is saying and how he's moving? The second thing that happened, got to move quickly in John 6, verse 60. Many of his disciples said this. Watch this. This is very hard to understand. 
you should kind of hear them whining. And these are disciples, y'all. These are followers of Christ. I can't believe he's saying this. This is hard, Jesus. How can anyone accept this? And Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. And he said to them, does this offend you? Does, does this really offend you? And in verse 66, watch what happens. After hearing this hard teaching, at this point, many of his disciples turned away. And they deserted him. Second response to Jesus was casual. We'll call it casual. There were critical people. And then there were those that were just kind of casual. There were disciples, but they were casual disciples. Are we so casual that when Jesus says something that is uncomfortable to us, that we walk away? Are we so casual that when we find something in God's word that's hard, that's hard, that we just say, well, I'm done with this. One of the things that COVID did, that the pandemic did, and this is a hard saying, was that it revealed a problem with casual Christianity. Like it revealed a problem that in many cases we didn't even know that we had. And I'm not saying North Rock, I'm talking about the church worldwide. Lots and lots and lots of casual Christians. So when things got a little bit hard, they just walked away. When things got a little bit difficult, when they couldn't like, I want the power, but they weren't really interested in the presence. They didn't have that kind of relationship. I can't have a relationship with Alicia where I, I just want the benefits. I just, I, want, I just want what she can offer me. I actually like to sit with her and talk with her and just be in a room with her. We sat in the office to, just a moment before this service and we just sat there in the room together in her presence. This is the kind of relationship that God wants with all of us. He doesn't want just this half-hearted, casual relationship where we just want what he's capable of and it doesn't really matter that he's the Christ. No, we... we we, we, need, we need to be have an intimate relationship with him. This is why at North Rock, I'm always calling you to take your next step. There's a method to the madness. Why are you always pushing us to join a group? Why are you always pushing us to serve? Because I've seen the issues with casual Christianity. And it's okay for you to live in the periphery at North Rock. This is a safe place for you to kick the tires but I'm going to always be calling you out of the periphery into the middle. I'm going to always be calling you. Because I know that casual Christianity generally ends with a casualty. It just does. I heard for years, if you will live for God hard, it's easy. But if you live for God easy, it's hard. It's hard. And, and if you're kind of just drifting with culture, you're kind of hanging on to, the, to, to Jesus, but... Eventually, you're going to come to a point where there's like a line in the sand where culture is saying this one thing, they're yelling one thing in your ear, and God's word is saying something else. You're hearing preaching that is, that is different, and you're going to be like, that's hard. <laughs> that's just hard. So, see ya. I've seen, I've seen that too much. So, I'm calling you to this next phase. This next phase. Where Jesus, in verse 66, at this point, many of the disciples turned away and they deserted him. And Jesus turned to the 12 and said, are you, are you going to leave too? Are you going to leave too because it's hard? Simon Peter replied, Lord, where would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe. That's the key. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. So I'm calling North Rock to this third phase, which is commitment. I'm committed to you, God. Good times, I'm committed. Bad times, I'm committed. When I'm on the mountain, I'm committed. When I'm in the valley, I'm committed. You are the only thing that can save me, satisfy me, sustain me, and I'm going to stay committed 
to you. I'm going to go all in, Lord. I'm going to do everything, Lord. I'm joining. I'm not just going to join one small group. I'm going to join like six. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve. I'm going to give. I'm going to make sure my family's in the house. I'm going to make sure my kids are at student nights. I'm going to make sure my, my younger kids are in Kids Rock every weekend because I'm committed to this thing. I'm not going to be casual about it. I'm not going to raise casual believers. I'm in this. I'm in it to win it. And I know that the only way I can do that is by being committed. Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words that give us eternal life. Let me pray for you today. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for speaking to us, Jesus. I am so grateful that you save us, that you satisfy us, that you sustain us. And God, I pray for people that have gathered in any of our locations that are searching for satisfaction. I pray that they would realize and recognize afresh today, or maybe for the first time today, that the only fulfillment, the only satisfaction they can ever find is in you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we're not going to be critical. We're not going to be casual about our relationship with you, but we're going to be committed to your house, to your family. We're going to be committed to your cause. As I continue to pray today, if you are at any of our locations and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to him right now, right now. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to fix everything in your life. You don't have to try to posture yourself to be good enough. You don't have to try to earn enough points. You just have to believe. You don't have to understand everything about Jesus. That's what faith is all about. We are saved by grace through faith. Through faith. We believe even though we don't really understand how or why. So let's... I, I want to pray for people at every location who need to surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Or maybe you need to rededicate, re-surrender your life to him. Either way, this moment is for you. So I would ask for all heads bowed, all eyes closed at every location. No one looking around. If you're watching online, you know who you are. And I just have you online to throw a hand emoji up in the chat there if you want to be part of this prayer. But if you're at any of our locations and you say, Jonathan, I need a fresh start today. I do. I need, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to declare again that I believe wholeheartedly in him or, or for the first time. Will you just throw a hand in the air right now? Come on, hold it high at every location. I need a fresh start today. I'm surrendering everything to him. Come on, Midtown. Come on, Bulverde. That's right, Stone Oak. Hold them up high. Leave them up if you don't mind. Hands all over the building. I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it. You are our bread of life, Lord Jesus. You are our bread of life. Okay, you can put your hands down now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. I invite everybody to pray this along with me in your own words. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. This amazing weekend, I'm starting over. I'm making you the Lord of my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you gave your life for me and that you rose from the grave. And today, I repent. I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to save me like only you can. I'm making you the Lord of my life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. A big hand for everybody who just took that step of faith. That's awesome, y'all.